get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran, and it's application only. Today, I'm very excited. We have a gritty, amazing salesperson, business person, entrepreneur, CEO. Adam Witte is a founder and CEO of Advantage Media Group. What began in the spare bedroom of his home is now an international publishing company. Advantage has been named to the prestigious Inc. 500 5000 list of America's fastest growing private companies and the best places to work in South Carolina multiple years in a row. He's the author, practices what he preaches, so he, he's the author of five books. He's the chairman of a nonprofit youth entrepreneur, it's called Youth Entrepreneurship South Carolina, and he's chairman of Clemson Entrepreneurship Institute. Adam, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thanks so much for having me. We're gonna have fun today. We're gonna have an amazing time, and you know what? I didn't realize that yesterday you formed this amazing partnership with Forbes. And so tell me about what's going on right now. Yeah. So um, I'm a big believer that entrepreneurs have to be the best salesperson of their business. Yeah. And so this is a deal that we've been working on for well over a year. But yesterday um, we announced a long-term uh, strategic partnership with Forbes Media, which is the publisher of the Forbes magazine that probably most people have heard of. Yeah. And we have created Forbes Books. So we have co-created with them a book publishing business that's going to literally turn the industry on its head. Um, We're bringing the advantage publishing model that's helped over a thousand CEOs and entrepreneurs get books done really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And we're combining that with the Forbes brand and 54 million monthly readers at Forbes.com and bringing those together to create Forbes books. You look so calm right now. (laughs) Is it about to hit the fan right now? Like, <laughs> you know, the the good thing is that big deals take a long time to happen. Yeah. Uh, it takes a long time to gestate. I, I was I was thinking you were going to say it was in the making for five years or ten years. So I'm surprised it's one year, actually. Yeah, it's it's been about uh, thirteen months probably. Yeah, and so we've had a lot of time to prepare and plan for it. And uh, I'm also probably somebody that is not um, very. Um, emotional, excitable. <laughs> yeah, I'm not very excitable, which can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing sometimes too. Um, we're really excited, super, super excited, but we feel prepared, and I think it's going to be a great success. So, how did that start 13 months ago? How did yes, that idea well, start? So, I'm, I'm having lunch with a friend of mine, and he was doing business with Forbes for his business. And he was telling me a little bit about the work that he was doing with Forbes. And I looked at him and I said, dude, you know, what about the business I'm in? I said, (laughs) you know, Forbes is the largest business publisher in the world. They don't have a book publishing business at all. And Advantage is a pioneer in business publishing for CEOs and entrepreneurs who are Forbes readers. And I said, there's got to be a match here. So yeah. he introduced us. I went in and kind of, you know, did the dog and pony show, I guess, as you might say. Yeah. Uh, told him about Advantage, explained where I thought that there were synergies yeah. and how we could help them. And how by applying the Forbes brand and the Forbes platform to the business that we're in, it could be one plus one equals four, right? One plus right. one equals five. Yeah, And... They had always shunned the traditional book publishing business because it's hard to make money and it's really a contracting, dying business. Um, You know, only one out of 10 books that are published by mainstream commercial publishers actually make money. So, you know, obviously you're in business to make money. Well, those aren't good odds, those aren't good statistics. 
And so when we explain the advantage business model, right. which is different from commercial right. publishing, right. Forbes immediately loved it. And our thing at Advantage is we're not going to help you create a book to sell copies and bookstores. Right. That's what I was going to say. It's a little bit misleading because you're not really there to make someone a best-selling author and sell millions of copies, right? That, that's exactly right. Yeah. We're in business to help an entrepreneur, a professional, build their thought leadership, right. build their credibility, and as we like to say, become the authority in the field. Right. And being the author of a book makes you a thought leader. Yeah. It makes you seen as an expert and a leader. And a number of business people have done books successfully. And I would argue that every entrepreneur, every CEO, every business professional probably should be the author of a book about yeah. something. Yeah. You know, whatever it is that they know a lot about. Right. And the process of getting a book created and getting it published and actually knowing how to effectively use it is complex, arcane, and most people never do it. Right. So when I started Advantage, we said, we've got to make this a turnkey, one-stop shop, and we've got to make it quick and easy for people to get books done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a thousand books later, um, I think we've done a pretty good job at that. We've got yeah. 40... We've got a thousand authors in forty-four states and thirteen countries, and uh, all of them have been able to use a book to build their credibility, build their right. thought leadership, and for many of them, like dramatically grow their business right. as a result of it. Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of. I've read your your reading your your writings on how people can use a book to help their business, right? Because even if they do get one speaking engagement or whatever it is, it's worth the whole price and time and energy. So what are some ways that you tell people they need to use a book to help their business? I mean, speaking is one. Yeah. Or maybe was, talk about some of the, your favorite examples from, I mean, I personally know three people who have used your service, um, you know, Scott Gray, Steve Cesari, and I interviewed Pat Williams um, mm -hmm. before who is – you know, one of your early mentors. Um, That's right. So talk about some ways pe you have found people have been successful in using a book to improve or launch their business. So let's use Dr. Scott Gray. Yeah. He's a great example. Yeah. So Scott Gray is a chiropractor in uh, Ohio, outside yeah. of Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Uh, owns his own practice. And there are 158 other chiropractors within a 25 mile radius of his office. Okay. Yeah. That, that's a lot of competition. And what every entrepreneur has to remember is that people buy on perception, not necessarily on reality. I mean, you know, we vote perception for is reality, right? <laughs> perception is reality. Right. You know, we, we vote for politicians on perception. We buy food at the restaurant on perception. Right. You know, we, we make all of our purchase decisions on perception. And so the other thing you should know is that people believe what other people say about you, not what you say about you. Right. And so every entrepreneur really has a duty to create a positive perception that others will have of them. And it can actually be done very strategically. Right. We call it authority marketing. Right. And that is the strategic and systematic process of building yourself up as an authority in your industry, uh, in your community, if you're a local uh, business like Scott Gray, or in your marketplace. So Scott Gray runs a chiropractic office. Um, his primary audience are women. Most of his patients are women. And his specialty is helping them with back pain. Right. So he writes a book because he knows a lot about this topic. He writes a book with our help titled Good Back, Bad Back. Right. And I love the cover too. It's a, a good-looking cover. Yeah. It's a good-looking cover. It appeals to women because that's who he's trying to attract. And the subtitle of the book says, What Every Woman Needs to Know About Back Pain. Okay? So he's clearly communicated who the book's for, women, and what the book's about, back pain. 
So if you're a female with back pain, which, oh, by the way, that's his target audience, then this is the book written exactly for you. Right. So if you go to Scott Gray's website, the first thing that you see is his book and the opportunity to request a free copy of his book. He's used the book to get on television, yeah. both locally and nationally. He's used the book to get on a number of radio shows in the greater Columbus area. And he's written all kinds of articles off of his book. So if you Google Scott Gray, Back Pain, Columbus, Ohio, he tops all of those search results. In addition to that, he has now dramatically differentiated himself from the 157 other chiropractors in Ohio. Because guess what? He's the only one of the 158 that have written a book. Right. And so if you're in Columbus, Ohio, and you're a woman and you have back pain and you're trying to decide who should I go see, do you want to go see the author or do you want to go see the chiropractor? Mm -hmm. Right. You want to go see, you want to go see the author. Yeah. And, and that's where, you know, the perception that we create can lead to the reality that we want. So yeah, to your, your point, Jeremy, speaking engagements, uh, a lot of our authors will use their book for consulting, but you know, a lot of them are just like Scott Gray, where they're using the book to generate leads, to convert leads into paying customers. Right. So you walk into Forbes, what mm -hmm. you're a sales, natural salesperson. You've been doing it since you were young. What do you tell them? How do you, how do you get them on board? Cause it's a big company you walk in. Yeah. So first of all, you do it very carefully. <laughs> uh, and, and secondly, you have to realize that when you're, I call it whale hunting. Right. Um, and there was a book written a couple of years ago titled Whale Hunting. And it was about how to land big, big sales. Right. Um, the first thing you got to realize is that you're not going to make the sale in the first visit. Right. Um, it's a relationship building process. And I've always remembered a mentor of mine said this when I was little. He said, Adam, people do business with those that they know, like, and trust. So the first meeting, the whole purpose was just to meet so they got to know me. Uh, hopefully they would like me. And to demonstrate my competence and the competence of our company so by the end of the meeting, they had some trust, right. right? Yeah. So that was one out of five in-person meetings. Where are they located? Where did you have to go to? They're, they're in Manhattan, okay. in, in New York City. Okay. And um, we probably had another 10 to 12 conference calls. Yeah. It's a big time commitment for you to fly out there and, and money commitment. Huge time commitment, huge money commitment. But, but remember... You've always got to look at sales as an investment. Yeah, uh, That's what business development is. I was making an investment in building a relationship with Forbes because I was confident that if I could build the proper relationship with them yeah. and I could show them the value that we could create, I, I felt pretty good that we might be able to put a partnership together. Yeah. Now, you don't make every sale and you have to go into it knowing that as I like to say, some will, some won't. Who cares who's next? Right. You know, somebody told me once, they said, the greatest salespeople are just like the greatest quarterbacks. They have really short memories. Right. Right? <laughs> yeah. Because you're going to get rejected all the time. So you've got to just keep coming back and going on. Right. So with Forbes, it was a build trust over time no like trust and ultimately solve a problem for them. Yeah. And one of the problems that they have is that they want to leverage the Forbes brand to a higher degree to increase the share of their audience, you know, grow a bigger audience and generate more revenue, right? right? Yeah. Which that's the goal of most businesses. Right. And so we said, listen, you guys have never had a book publishing line, but Forbes is a really valuable and trusted name in business. Oh, huge, yeah. So imagine for a minute if every year we were publishing 
50, 60, 70, 80 new books under the Forbes imprint or the, the Forbes name. That would be hundreds of thousands of words of content, actually probably millions of words of content, that could be distributed and shared with the Forbes audience, which is 54 million unique visitors a month to Forbes.com, and we could generate revenue off of that, that, you know, that part of that money would go to you. So it's a way for them to accomplish two things. One was create more highly... Uh, curated content for their readers, and secondly, uh, generate additional revenue streams. Yeah. So I knew going into the meeting what their objectives were as a business, and I was able to make sure that the solution that I thought I could give them by partnering would achieve those uh, objectives. Yeah. And, and fortunately, I was able to clearly articulate that and um, you know Forbes has a great track record of being very innovative when it comes to the media they, they were the first magazine to create a website yeah. in 1996 yeah. and they had a first mover advantage that no website has been able uh, no magazine has been able to rival and so I, I've got to credit Forbes is very good about taking very smart risks on new media ventures that are following the trends in the industry. So how will it be launched um, now that it's, it's yeah. formed? So, so we launched Forbes Books yesterday. So big press release went out, uh, did a bunch of interviews this morning, and we're doing a launch event in Charleston uh, tomorrow night. So um, the senior vice president of Forbes is flying down to Charleston, and we're doing a media event and a party at our office. And the, the first thing that we're going to do is a number of Advantage authors. So, you know, we have over a thousand Advantage authors. A lot of them have really great content that fit the Forbes reader sweet spot right. really, really well. Yeah. And so the first thing we're going to do is go to some of our Advantage authors and see if it would make sense to publish a new edition of their book under the Forbes imprint. Um, the second thing that we're going to do is begin to, you know, market and advertise that Forbes Books is a new publishing option for business people. And so you'll see us um, present in Forbes magazine. You'll see us present on Forbes.com uh, through a lot of their email marketing and their email newsletters. And we're going to begin looking for top tier entrepreneurs, CEOs and business leaders that might have a book idea or an existing manuscript that would make sense for the Forbes uh, imprint. So if you visit ForbesBooks.com, you can actually apply hmm. to be considered for publication. That's awesome. How will people decide or how will you decide if they're under the Forbes brand or your current brand? Yeah, the Advantage brand. Yeah. So, so really carefully, uh, one is very, very strict editorial guidelines that every book published under the Forbes imprint has to meet. Um, we have pretty stringent guidelines as well at Advantage, but obviously, you know, the Forbes name is yet another step above. So that's the first thing is that it has to meet a certain guideline and every book that we publish um, is ultimately approved by um, yeah. a senior editor at Forbes. I guess it's a topic too, right? I mean, if someone's talking about exactly. health-related things, it's not going to be under the Forbes brand. Yeah, the, so, so right. The second thing is, does the content meet the Forbes reader at the right spot? And, you know, interestingly, what you said about kind of healthcare, um, when I went into it, I thought the same thing. Right. And Forbes said, actually we're building out a really large healthcare vertical hmm. and creating all kinds of content in the healthcare space. And some books might actually be a fit. Interesting. So, um, you know, books on financial topics, healthcare topics, you know, management, leadership, marketing, sales, all of yeah. those kinds of topics. And then, you know, business biographies, um, there's a lot of really successful CEOs and entrepreneurs and executives. Yeah. They're not on the Forbes 400. 
but they still have super interesting stories right. that you could learn a lot from. For sure. We want to tell some of those stories. Yeah. Adam, you know, you're an interesting guy. You know, when I did the research, um, you there's this one moment where you when you started the company and um, you said selling is huge for you, right? Can you talk about that initial from the idea you went and I think you booked a booth at a conference, right? Yeah. So yeah. talk about what happened and, and, and what you did. So, um, so I have a quote on the wall in my office and it says, the world belongs to a salesman with leadership. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, when I started Advantage, uh, I had never published a book before in my life. Right. But I had worked for two summers as an intern for a publishing company. So uh, my mentor, a guy named Pat Williams, who's the founder of the Orlando Magic basketball team, uh, he convinced me to start a publishing company. And he convinced me and he said, Adam, you need to help business people and entrepreneurs and professional speakers. You need to help them get books done. And you're how old at this point? You're in college? Uh, I was or? 23. Yeah, so, right out of college. So right out of college, 23. And he said, um, you need to go to the National Speakers Association Convention. It's called NSA, National Speakers Association. And it, it's essentially a trade group for motivational speakers. Right. And he said, you need to buy a booth and that'll be the golden ticket, that, the golden goose and the golden ticket that lays golden eggs for the rest of your career. So not, not knowing any better, uh, I got a ticket to the NSA conference and I had a, a booth that was, it looked like a science fair project. You know, <laughs> it was, it was. The I mean, those booths aren't cheap, right? I no, mean... no. And it looked like a science fair project. It was, you know, it was like literally the cardboard booth that, you know, kind of opened up. I could picture my like, science fair. Yeah, I could picture. Yeah, exactly what you're saying. yeah. And what I did is I uh, printed off the book covers uh, of the company that I was interning for. Like I went to their website and, and printed off the book covers. These were all the books that this company was publishing. And I pasted them up on the booth and I created a brochure and I started talking to people. And literally at the end of the three day conference, I had 13 signed contracts wow. and 13 deposit checks. Wow. And, and that was really the market's way of telling me you got something here. How do you decide you know, what to charge just, at that point? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of it was just, you know, kind of, you know, making it up and inventing it as I, I go on. I, I've always said my philosophy as an entrepreneur is sell it, then build it. Right. Um, you know, I looked at what were other people paying to publish books and how much value are we really creating for them? Yeah. And interestingly, interesting, yeah. I think you learn this the hard way. The first couple of years, I dramatically undervalued myself. Yeah. And, and I undervalued what we were selling right. because I just wanted people to buy. I wanted customers. Right. And I needed the money. Yeah. I mean, I needed the money. Uh, three or four years into it, I really you know, had a wake up call. And I said, wait a minute, what we're doing is a whole lot more valuable than what we're charging. Yeah. We need to, we need to increase our prices. And since the time I started the company and, and keep in mind, what we offer is a lot different. Our, our prices have gone up by a factor of 20. Yeah. Right now, what we do today is a lot different, but I can now make one sale Whereas before I had to make 20 sales to get the same amount of money. Right. That's crazy. So talk about the difference. Early on, you were the idea was you'd produce a book for someone, right? So how did you, besides sleeping in a Holiday Inn that night, decide that you were going to, because after you sold those contracts, you, that was the first time you were going to produce a book for someone. So how did you oh, get it I, done? I had the, the oh shit moment of 
I got the money. <laughs> right. Now what am I going to do? Right. Right. So you figure it out. <laughs> I mean, you figure it out the hard way. Trial and error. And I'll, I'll never forget, this is a great story and a great lesson for somebody starting a business. So one of the 13 people that signed up to do a book with us, um, his name is Steve Gilliland. And he's a pretty well-known motivational speaker, um, very successful, um, speaks probably 150 times a year. Yeah. So um, on the high end in terms of the number of yeah. engagements that he does. And he was just starting his speaking career. He had signed up to do a book with us. He had paid $2,500. And a couple weeks after the conference, I get a certified letter. This does and not sound good right now. No, it does not. It, it wasn't good. And like I hadn't really gotten any certified mail up until this point. So I get a certified letter. And the letter says, uh, we met at the NSA Convention. Um, there was a misunderstanding. I thought your company was a different company. And I'd like to request a full refund. And, you know, you don't need to do any work on my behalf. So it seems like a rather innocent mistake on his part. The problem was, number one, legally, I, I didn't owe him his money back. But more than that, like, I didn't have the money to give him. <laughs> I'd already spent it. Really? Yeah. So I'd already spent the money. So I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? So I figured out a way to cobble together the money. And I wrote him back and I said, Steve, um, I'd like to give you a full refund. And uh, I want to publish your book for you at no charge. Hmm. So what made you decide to do that? Insanity. No. <laughs> Um, <laughs> partial insanity. You know, I, I think at the end of the day, Jeremy, it, it, it's just this idea that relate the the power of relationships right. is so important when you're starting a business. Yeah. But so is eating, right? I mean, at that point, like yeah. now, it's easy to say, but at yeah. that point, you don't have the money, right? And you want then are going to have to spend money to publish his book. I, I try to think the decision that I'm making today. How does that impact me a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now? Right. So here's what happens. Yeah. He takes me up on the offer. And I later realized he takes me up on the offer because he's essentially just as poor as I am. <laughs> I mean, he had just gotten into the speaking business. He's literally eating ramen too. Right. So I publish his book. It actually does really well. Uh, today, 2016, Steve Gilliland has published five books with us and has spent over a million dollars alone with advantage. Wow. And so the point is that a $2,500 refund turned into a million dollar customer. Right. Whereas had I just given him the money back, I mean, he would have been happy, but he would have went somewhere else. For sure. Um, and so I think that as entrepreneurs, we really have to think long term sometimes. Yeah. Which can be hard to do when you're starting. Because sure. every dime is precious. How did you get that initial book published? Did you just reach uh, out to a bunch of authors? I mean, a bunch of writers? Or what did you do? Yeah, I found, a, I found editors. I found a cover designer. Uh, I found somebody that could help me what they call paginate the book or, you know, lay out the book. Yeah. And then I uploaded it to a printer and got them printed and then, you know, entered all of the book information into the distribution system and like figured it out the really hard way. Right. And luckily it worked. <laughs> We're standing here today. Um, luckily. Who are some of the best-selling authors? I mean, I know the, the whole point of writing the book isn't that. I mean, there's so many ways to generate business, become the authority. But I'm sure you've, you've had some big names under Advantage Media. Um, 
Yeah, so you know, St- Steve Gilliland is a guy that he has sold tens of thousands, probably by this point over a hundred thousand copies of his various books. Um, Pat Williams, founder of the Orlando Magic, has done seven books with us. Yeah. Uh, Mike Veck, who uh, owns five minor league baseball teams and is kind of famous in the sports world. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Nicole Lee, who is a fitness model and um, a spokeswoman on Home Shopping Network. Um, and then we have a marketing agency as well that does marketing for a lot of authors. And some of these authors didn't publish their book with us. But some of our really well-known authors that we do marketing for are uh, Captain Sullenberger, who landed yeah, you know, a yeah. uh, plane in the Hudson River. Right. Um, Caddy Kay and Claire Shipman, who are anchors on ABC, Good Morning America, and BBC. Um, and Sally Hogshead, who's a really well-known for sure. uh, kind of brand and, and marketing expert. So we, we've had the chance to work with just uber fascinating people. Right. Again, it's not people that are on the Forbes 400 list, right. but these are people that know so much about the most interesting things. Right. It's just so much fun. Yeah, you know, Adam, I want to talk about marketing books, but I have to, t- to ask. So going back early on when you were a kid, you wanted to own an NBA basketball team, right? I, I want all this information. What's that? I don't know how you found all this information. I did my research, but I want to know that first letter you wrote to Pat and why. But I want to know today, do you still want to own an NBA basketball team? I would love to. You would? Yeah, yeah, I would. Which I one? Would. Uh, the Magic. The Magic? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I mean, I, I live in Charleston, South Carolina, but uh, it would be a dream to own an NBA basketball team. And the the magic as a kid, I grew up in Orlando, cheered for the magic for 10 years of my childhood. Mm. Uh, my heart still bleeds uh, black and silver and magic <laughs> blue. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's still it's still a goal. So what possessed you? How old were you? And you wrote a letter. How, how do you even most people know the players? They don't know the the founders. Right. So how do you even uh, know who Pat Williams was? And then what possessed you to write a letter to him? So uh, he wrote a book. It, so it all started with a book. Yeah. He wrote a book titled Making Magic. And it was a story about his founding of an NBA basketball team. Right. And, you know, you, you can't tell because I'm sitting down, but I, I'm six foot six, which in high school is pretty tall. Yeah. In, in, you know, college or the pros, that's nothing. But I was always tall. I played basketball. And I was a huge basketball fan. Right. So I had gone to a bunch of Magic games, and I read this book. And I was, like, mesmerized after I read the book. Right. And I thought, you know, I'm never going to be good enough. You're how old at this point? 15. 15, okay. Uh, I'm never going to be good enough to really play basketball professionally. But I could own a team. Or I could be the general manager of a team. Right. And that really began to get my wheels spinning. And so I figured, well, what the heck? I'm going to write this guy a letter. Right. So I write Pat Williams a letter. I send it off. And a couple weeks later, I get a letter back. And basically, he tells me he got the letter. And he sent me a box of all kinds of magic you know, paraphernalia. Cool. So what do I do? I write him back. (laughs) And then, and in the next letter, I said, I asked him if I could take him out to lunch. You're a great direct response copywriter. I mean, (laughs) I remember that uh, I couldn't even drive yet. So my mother had to drive me over to his office and there was, you know, a restaurant next to his office. So we walked to the restaurant, but I took him out to lunch at 15 and kind of, you know, built a friendship with him. And then when I started, I started a company in college that was in the sports industry. It was tickets, right? Ticketadvantage.com. Yeah. And I asked Pat Williams to be on my board and, and he agreed and was a close advisor right there. That's right. Yeah. And you know, the friendship just developed and evolved and then, 
he and I were having lunch right after I graduated and I was kind of unsure what I was going to do with myself after college. And he said, Adam, you have to start a publishing company mm -hmm. for professional speakers and business people. And that'll be the golden goose that lays the golden eggs. Wow. That's amazing. So, um, I, I mean, Pat Williams is certainly one of the most significant people in my professional career. Yeah. And arguably in my life. Yeah. So, Adam, a few more things. I mean, there's so much to talk about here. I want to hear about some of the challenges along the way because it hasn't always been walking to Forbes and getting that that huge sure. deal um, and you having to pick yourself up and just keep selling. So what are what have been some of the challenges with the business? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of challenges. I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat any of this. Um, being an entrepreneur is for the, the strong-willed Right. Um, you have to have mental toughness. Yeah. Some people call it grit. You've right. got to have grittiness, I think, to be successful. And yeah, I mean, I remember when uh, I had to, this was a year in, uh, I, it was during the real estate boom in 2005, 2006. And I had gotten a home equity loan on my condo. I owned a small, small, tiny condo. And I got like a $70,000 home equity line of credit. And, you know, a lot of people use those lines of credit to remodel their kitchen or take a vacation or buy a new car. I used it to cover payroll. <laughs> I mean, literally, I used it to cover payroll. Wow. Um, I remember um, falling short and having to, like, you know, take, take the money out of my own personal checking account take the money out of, which was really small at the time, and, you know, take the money out of the home equity line of credit. And, you know, a lot of people would say, well, you're crazy for doing that. I, I always believed. Yeah. And I still believe um, no matter what challenges the company faces, no matter what challenges I face, I just have this confidence that no matter what, I'll get through it. Yeah. And even if I don't know what the answer is right this second, yeah. I know I'll figure it out. You know, one thing I'll say, Jeremy, is that, you know, so many people think that being an entrepreneur is risky, right? Yeah. I think it's the safest thing that you could do right. because right. you get to control your destiny. And if you don't trust yourself, why do you trust more people more than yourself. Right. That's just that's just crazy to me. Um, so I've never once thought this isn't going to work. Um, now some people think that I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some people think that that I'm a lunatic. But I've always believed, and I think that anybody, you know, whether it's a guy like Steve Jobs who built a multi-billion-dollar company that everybody knows, or whether it's you know, an entrepreneur next door that nobody knows. I think th this belief and confidence in yourself and that no matter what, you'll figure it out. It's a must. Yeah. And, and we were talking a little bit before we got started and I wanted to stop you because it was, it was really good and I wanted to get it while we were recording is we were talking about, you're talking about the grittiness and you've, you know, obviously published thousands of books, but you know, dealt with, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of entrepreneurs, because I know you've judged startups and you know, you're a member of boards. What are some of the successful traits that you've seen, characteristics of, of successful entrepreneurs? Yeah, so you know, with any startup, I, I've always believed you know, you're evaluating the jockey, not the horse. Mm -hmm. So if somebody said, hey, will you invest in my business? I'm probably more concerned about the CEO or the entrepreneur that I'm investing in than the actual business. Yeah, what do you look for? Yeah. Um, so, so here's what I look for. Uh, I look for confidence, not arrogance. Confidence. There's a big difference, and and there's a line. But but I, I look for confidence and belief, which which is kind of what we were talking about, you know, before. Um, I look for somebody that sees the big picture. And really has a 500 foot view more than a five inch view, right? Because if, if you're going to build a big company, if you're going to build a really big and great company, you've got to be able to see the big picture 
and how what you can do is, you know, life changing, world changing, industry changing, what have you. Yeah. I mean, I've always believed like, why start a small business when you can start a really big business? Right. Right? I mean, that's a whole lot more fun to me. So I'm looking for people that, that think big and, and see the big picture. Um, I'm looking for somebody that knows how to sell. And that, that doesn't mean that they're like trained in how to be an ace salesman, but it means that they can articulate how they have a company that can solve other people's problems and, and how it's a true solution you know, in the world, in the marketplace. So I, I'm looking at that. And then I think also, you know, just a final thing is, is I, I, inv I invest in and I look for entrepreneurs that are logical, not emotional. They're logical, but also they're thick skinned, meaning, you know what? They, they can take a lick and they can get right back up. Right. They have and, and that goes back to the grittiness um, but it, it's it's really resiliency and the ability to persevere. Yeah. Because I'm telling you what, starting a business from scratch, it ain't easy. It right. ain't easy one bit. Yeah. And if you think it's a walk in the park, and if you think that everything's going to be served to you on a silver platter, you couldn't be any more wrong. Right. And so the ability to take the lick and keep on trucking, keep on ticking, keep on walking – Boy, I mean, yeah. that, that's important. Yeah. Super important. So, Adam, I have one last question, if we have time for it. Um, yep. But I want to point people towards where they should check you out. I know um, AdvantageFamily.com. That's right. That's the, the website people can check out. Any other places on the web? I know you mentioned ForbesBooks.com. Where else should we point people towards to, to check out what you have going on? You can check out AdamWitty.com as well. Adam Witty, yeah. W I T T Y. That's right. Yeah. Like smart, clever, and funny. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so check those out advantagefamily.com, ForbesBooks.com, AdamWitty.com. My last question is I want you to just briefly run through, you can do it quickly, the evolution of your offices. Because you started off in your bedroom and now you're in, I think, like a 10,000 square foot facility. Yep. Right. Yep. Take me through the journey. I mean, you don't have to go into detail, but you start off in your spare bedroom. Your spare bedroom. What were the some of the offices? Yep. Along the way. So we went from a bedroom, which yep. I don't know was maybe a hundred square feet, um, to a twelve hundred square foot office that could probably comfortably fit I don't know five or six people. And then we went to about 1,800 square feet. And then we went to about 2,600 square feet. And then we kind of maxed out at like 2,800 square feet in, in the office building we were in. Yeah. Like we had just kept eating up all the little offices next right. to ours right. and turned into one office. And we were busting at the seams. And then we uh, moved to... The, the office where we are now, yeah. which it's a two-story building. Because yeah. it's a huge it's, jump, right? Yeah, huge jump. Yeah. I mean, we're going from 2,800 square feet to 5,000 square feet. So we basically double. And <clears throat> the building that we're in, two stories, we took the first floor knowing that we would have the ability to grow into the second floor when we were ready. Right. And so um, we took our time, and that took a couple more years to fully <clears throat> fill out, if you will, the 5,000 square feet. Yeah. Then we took over the next 5,000 square feet. Uh, and then we also have an office in Austin, Texas, which oh, wow. is 5,000 square feet. Wow. So yeah. is that people, pro books, or both? So it's largely marketing. Um, we have a uh, marketing agency business yeah. and our publishing business, and the hub of our uh, marketing business is based in Austin, Texas. Got it. Which was a strategic acquisition that we made. Wow. Adam, congratulations with everything. Um, I really appreciate your time. This is always fantastic to hear your stories. Go ahead. Are you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say one more thing about the office space. Yeah. Uh, 
So I've always believed that, you know, people are your greatest asset in building a company. Yeah. I don't care what industry you're in. Uh, you will have to have people if you want to build a real business, meaning a big business. I mean, if you want to build a business that's a $20 million company, a $50 million company, $100 million company, a billion dollar company, one thing that all these bigger companies have in common is they need great people to power those businesses. Yeah. And so when it comes to the physical environment, you know, the physical office that your people are in, I've always been a big believer in investing money and making the office really first class. Yeah. And that is, it's inviting, it's vibrant, lots of colors. Like if you come to our office, there's, you know, quotes all around the office. There's book covers all over the office, copies of Forbes magazine, you know, motivational posters and signs and, you know, all kinds of advantage branded stuff. My goal is to make our office look like Disneyland. Right. And if every wall isn't covered, then I still have work to do. <laughs> um, and and so I would just say to entrepreneurs that are growing, that are hiring people, it's your job to make the place that they come to work fun, exciting, yeah. and vibrant. Yeah. It, it's your job. It's not their job. It's your job to do that. Um, one of our core values is create an environment that breeds greatness. And I think that if entrepreneurs can successfully create an environment in their business that breeds greatness, then, yeah. then the business will grow and the business will prosper. Yeah. See, when you keep talking, it makes me want to ask more questions. So I'm just going to cut myself off. Because, <laughs> um, you know, it, it is true. And I want to know what, what do your staff say is most fun or what's <laughs> come out of conversations because you obviously focus in on this and that is a priority i mean you were voted one of the best places to work um so that's a that's a huge core value for you what's what's something that maybe someone else could implement into their office that your staff has said is fun or, or came out of some kind of meeting yep so we have something our big hairy audacious goal is called the road to a thousand which is publishing a thousand books per year mm -hmm. uh, by December 31st of 2018. Um, we have something called the pub to a thousand mm -hmm. and we have a bar in yeah. our office. You just take a thousand shots. No, I'm just kidding. Not a thousand shots. <laughs> okay. um, but the pub to a thousand is open every Friday afternoon from 4.30 to 5.30. Okay. And we do a company-wide huddle uh, at 4.23 p.m. Eastern time. And the team in Austin joins us. And they have a bar in Austin as well. And we do a quick seven-minute kind of, you know, really. Like it's a like stand a pep rally. type of thing. It's a stand-up. Yeah. It's a quick pep rally reviewing all the accomplishments as a team we've achieved in the past week. Hmm. And then the pub's open for an hour for people to get a beer and catch up. And just, you know, talk to their friends. Right. Um, that's a small thing. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. For but, sure. I, but, but I think it's a difference maker. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, recognizing people, we do something called Caught in the Act of Greatness. Yeah. And every Friday afternoon, people fill out their Caught in the Act of Greatness cards and recognize each other for doing great work. Yeah. Because, you know, we have 52 people in our company there's a lot of good stuff that I never see. Yeah. And so if you're counting on me to call it out, it's never going to happen because right. I just never see it. Right. So we, we really need to kind of call out each other and recognize each other. So, so that's a small thing that we yeah. do. Yeah. Um, so all these little things, you know, creating the culture is so important. I, you know, I've always believed, and, and one of our authors, he, he famously says, he says, when I walk into a company, I can smell the culture hmm. immediately. And he says, culture is either by design or it's by default. Yeah, yeah. And, and he said, if you want to build a great business, you have to be intentional and design the culture exactly as you want it. Yeah. You can't just leave it up to someone to create or organically for it to just bubble up right if you let that happen it's probably going to be a culture that you may not want yeah 
Adam, thank you. I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out all the sites I list, you know, I mentioned before, advantagefamily.com. Thanks for taking the time, even though you've launched a huge deal with Forbes uh, in, the in the past few days. So I really appreciate it. Jeremy, real pleasure. So awesome to be with you. And thanks so much for the inspiration that you give to entrepreneurs week in and week out. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. I really appreciate it. And good luck with the buying the NBA team. So anyone that knows out there that can help Adam with that, let him know. <laughs> what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.